Hello, um, and welcome to this Sunday morning or Saturday evening or Sunday night, uh, Romancing the Gothic Talk. Um, thank you so much to Sam Hurst for inviting me to come along. My name is Dr. Dara Downey, um, and I am currently very slowly trying to write a literary biography of Shirley Jackson for the Palgrave Literary Lives series, which is quite exciting. Um, and so the general kind of aim of the, the Palgrave series is to write biographies of authors that focus on their work rather than on their lives. And this is suiting me very well um, because as I'm going to discuss today, I work quite hard when I talk about Jackson to try and sort of push a bit against the, the sort of very strong biographical trend that you tend to get in readings of Jackson's work, um, a trend that has a tendency to kind of massively conflate her life and her work to see one as the key to the other and vice versa, um, which, you know, I think it can often come up with really interesting readings um, and, you know, lots of people have done great work in that area. I, however, um, as I always say, I was raised post-structuralist. I believe in the death of the author. And so, in a way, I'm, I'm kind of a slightly odd person to be writing a biography of an author because I kind of think that we should disentangle those two things. But on the other hand, I think that this is a great opportunity for me to slightly, I think, kind of push against the tendency, not just with Jackson, but I think with a lot of other female writers, particularly those who are writing around the middle of the 20th century, people like Plath and Anne Sexton, um, you know, the, the kind of critical tendency, not just to laminate them onto their biography too much, but to reduce them to the elements of their biography that are often really fascinating in lots of ways um, that tell us lots of things about the way in which uh, sort of female presenting people were treated in mid-century America, the way in which mental illness was treated. All of these things are great, but I also kind of want to move beyond that because I have no fear that those kind of readings will continue in the future, so I don't need to add to that. So um, actually a quick note before I move on to my next slide, um, which is that if you haven't seen Dr. Amy Bride's talk on Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House um, for Romancing the Gothic, it's really excellent. We cover a certain amount of the same ground, um, but what I think her talk does really well, which I therefore won't bother redoing, um, is she kind of sets up Jackson and her work uh, and her life a little bit. So, and also she sets up The Haunting of Hill House in a bit more detail than I do. So if you feel like you need a little bit more kind of background for all of that, go and watch Amy's really excellent talk um, and that should kind of set you up for that a bit. So, right, first of all, come on. <laughs> Next slide, come on. Oh, there we go, okay, right. It may be a little bit like that. So, as I was saying, um, one of the reasons why I like to kind of push, uh, which I haven't said, um, it's quite a kind of socio-historically embedded reading of Shirley Jackson is because of the way that her work has been read literally from the moment that she passed away very, very suddenly in the late, um, sort of mid to late 1960s. She did, she was in the middle of writing a new book um, called Come Along With Me, which could have been absolutely fascinating, and we can talk about that if you want. Um, but. She passed away, she left a, a vast body of sort of unpublished material and also very successfully published material. And her husband, Stanley Edgar Hyman, um, you may have opinions about, I certainly do. Um, one of the things that he did in 1966, very soon after the very sudden death of his wife, was he published a volume called The Magic of Shirley Jackson, which included some short stories, some of which hadn't been published previously, um, and, and also some longer material. And Hyman actually kind of admits in this already that there has been a particular trend in the way that Jackson's work has been approached. So he says that her, quote, fierce visions of dissociation and madness, of alienation and withdrawal, of cruelty and terror are very often and very easily interpreted as, quote, personal, even neurotic fantasies on the part either of the characters or the author herself, or indeed both. So, in other words, there is a tendency in her work to do what 
sorry, in responses to her work um, to do what critics often do in relation both to female characters in the Gothic and to female authors, which is to say it's all in her head. Um, to say, you know, there is nothing going on here. This person does not need to be worried about the world that she's living in or the people around her or the structures that she occupies. This person just is failing to adjust and therefore we should dismiss everything that she says. And like I say, this is one of the reasons why I think it's kind of important to, instead of just focusing on the individual and the individual psyche, to think a little bit more about the, the sort of wider structures that are happening around her. And one of those structures is the house, the, the physical house and other kinds of buildings that proliferate in Jackson's work. So to start with one example, um, I'm also experimenting with what I think is probably not really old text, but me attempting to describe pictures in my slides. And um, so I do apologize if I'm doing a ham-fisted job of that. Uh, but anyway, so, for example, um, in one of Jackson's very early novels, The Bird's Nest um, from 1954, we have a situation where our main character, whose name is Elizabeth, uh, suffers from a version of um, multiple personality disorder. Jackson did quite a lot of work on this before she wrote the novel. Um, and again, that is a talk for another day. But one of the interesting things um, in terms of what I'm thinking about social structures and physical structures is the way that the novel very, very, very early sets up this sort of undecidability in terms of what is going on in Elizabeth's mind and also in Elizabeth's life more broadly. So we're told that it is not proven that Elizabeth's personal equilibrium was set off balance by the set of the office floor, nor could it be proven that it was Elizabeth who pushed the building off its foundations, but it is undeniable that they began to slip at about the same time. So what is going on here? Um, Elizabeth has Oh, what I must admit seems to be a lovely calm job in a museum building um, where she just sorts some stuff out for a while. She has some gentle admin to do. People very rarely ring her. She has no emails. It just sounds great. Um, but at the same time, it's also a really meaningless job. And she goes into work every day. Um, she's her mother has passed away. She's living with her aunt who isn't particularly sympathetic. And as the book starts, as you can see here, this is on page eight there is a sense that everything starts to slip. Uh, everything goes a little bit off balance, both internally um, in what's happening within her psyche, but also it seems externally. Now, what happens in the rest of the book makes it a little bit difficult to tell whether or not her office building is actually starting to tilt um, and whether or not there is actually a massive crack that opens up in the wall um, and in the floor. This may or may not be happening, but as far as I'm concerned, the whole point of all of this is the very undecidability of it. One of the things that I think Gothic texts do very well is they refuse to tell us precisely like this passage, whether our protagonists are imagining things or whether things are going really badly outside of them. And in a way, that kind of indecidability is really important for the Gothic, because if it came down on the side of one or the other, things wouldn't be so unsettling. We as readers and our characters would be able to go, oh, okay, Grant, this is what's happening. Everything's fine. Let's just kind of move on. Let's deal with this now. And you'd find yourself perhaps in a detective story, maybe even in a romance novel, things would be a bit more straightforward. Whereas the very fact that as happens here, um, Elizabeth is not having a great time in life. Um, like I said, she doesn't get along very well at all with her aunt who she lives with, who's quite unsympathetic, though has her own stuff going on. She is not having a great time in mid-century America as a young single woman who has a slightly crappy job um, that is, you know, calm and undemanding, but nonetheless not particularly fulfilling. She is a quiet young lady and so her romantic prospects uh, which you know was all that was really open uh, for young women like herself middle class young women at the time white middle class young women um she doesn't really have any of these prospects and also people just kind of don't really get her so there is a sense that she is 
finding the world difficult, but that would be fine. You know, you would not be in a Gothic text if you were just able to say, yeah, I find the world a little bit difficult. What dumps you into a Gothic text is that sense of people going, yeah, but are you just like maybe imagining it? Could you not just like get over it? That sense that maybe perhaps this is my fault. Maybe I'm doing all of this. Maybe I'm making the world fall apart around me. And that's actually kind of a large part of what makes things so scary in the Gothic is that you, you can't trust yourself and you can't trust the outside world. But I think the very fact that we get this undecidability means that it's important that we don't just go straight to the, yes, it's on her head, yes, she can't cope answer, that we need to kind of think, okay, what are the external forces that are creating this sense of disequilibrium for Elizabeth and for an awful lot of other characters uh, in Jackson's work? Um, and I suppose I should just kind of pause at this stage um, and reiterate what Amy Bride says very nicely in her paper um, for Romancing the Gothic, which is that 1950s America uh, for white middle-class people was very much a, a world that was rigidly divided along very sort of binary gender lines. And when I say male or female, I suppose what I mean is the way that those things were understood at the time and the way that those things were part of sort of wider forms of sociocultural behavior and all of the rest of it. Obviously things are more complex than that, but the whole point of this world that Jackson is writing into is that if you attempt to live a life that is more complex than that, all of those social systems will come down on you like a ton of bricks and you will be shunted very carefully back into your nice neat little gendered box, particularly if you're white and particularly if you're middle class. So, undecidability. But there's an undecidability and I'm going to kind of come down on the side of the building rather than the brain, I suppose is what I'm gonna do in the rest of this paper. So when we're talking about buildings, um, some of this will be familiar to some of you, um, particularly in mid-century America, and again, particularly for white people, buildings were kind of a thing. Um, this was a world in which there was literally just a lot of building taking place. So this was happening because you got a lot of soldiers who are coming back from World War II. Uh, they had very generous loans that made it possible to, to marry, to set up a home, to have children, whereas maybe people would have been delaying it a bit before that. And suddenly this means that you get quite a lot essentially of kind of homogeneity in the way that people are living and in the way that their families are set. This also meant that there was a real rush to build, to build single family homes where people could live these kind of lives. And again, Amy Bride does a really nice job of kind of talking about the, the economics of all of that. So I would recommend that you watch her video as well. And, you know, these things don't happen by themselves. Um, you, you need a, a bit of a kind of propaganda push to get people to move into these places. You know, if previously everyone would have sort of moved into a, a sort of urban apartment a la Rosemary's Baby, or else you would have just lived in a very small town and not moved out of that small town. What was the thing that was going to drive people towards these slightly odd looking houses in the middle of nowhere where you had to drive everywhere? And a lot of that came in the form of a lot of discourse around the idea that the suburbs were a sort of semi-pastoral utopia, that they were a haven from the noise, the dirt, the crime, and the immorality of the city. Um, but at the same time, they weren't quite as isolated or as like, quote unquote, backward or degenerate as rural areas. So this was like, it was a big push towards really like saying quite bad things about the country and the city and saying, this is the perfect middle ground. This is exactly what you want. It'll be safe for your children. It'll be, you know, you'll have a large back garden. Sure, you don't know your neighbors, but you can work that out with all the barbecues that you're gonna have um, in that weird little patch of dirt that we've given you out back. Um, and if you were interested, Scott Donaldson's The Suburban Myth is a really great book about all of this. It's really clear um, and it's quite kind of quippy in places if you're into quippiness. Uh, so yes, um, and nonetheless, <laughs> 
things weren't quite as rational in the suburbs as people were led to believe. Um, you did have to drive everywhere, uh, often on big scary roads that killed lots of people. Um, everything looked kind of the same. And as a result, you got a lot of kind of borderline moral panics about the possibility that everyone living in identical houses and, you know, coming up with their 2.4 children would result in essentially a sort of a form of social breakdown. So on the one hand, you get this kind of vision of suburbia as a utopia. And on the other hand, you get people talking about this as like, this is going to destroy our world. No one is ever going to talk to one another again. This is going to be a place where everyone is just a, an atomized individual and everyone is without roots, without convictions, without permanence. Um, and yeah, these people orchard and push brown. Dear God, that's difficult to say. Um, yeah, they, again, writing in the 60s, um, they, they talk about these things. And so from my point of view, um, ooh, I think, sorry, because the, the little screen sharing thing is covering over my words. I think that there's a massive typo in the bottom of that, which I will fix for 10 o'clock tonight, but I can't read those words. Um, anyway, one way or the other, um, for me, one of the issues around this was that suburbia created precisely the kind of gender division that I was talking about a few minutes ago. It essentially demanded that women stayed home, kept the house clean and neat, looked after the children while they were there because, you know, if you were in a place where you didn't really know your neighbours, you couldn't just leave them running around. You had to bring them to school, you had to collect them from school, you then had to send them off to the various activities that were kind of springing up at the time while the husband got into the car or on the train and went to work, which was also kind of part of this whole push towards following World War II, getting women back out of the workplace to ensure that men had enough jobs. So all of this is part of like a huge system to cement a very sort of divided sense of gender roles in suburban white America. I will fix that slide. Um, oh, vipers, that's what I was looking for, not wipers. That's, I mean, they were wipers, but anyway. Okay, so, um, so, All of this was also, as I'm sure you know, taking place in the context of the early decades of the Cold War, um, particularly between America and Russia, or at least the US and Russia. Um, and in lots of ways, lots of the, the kind of public discourse at the time really created a, a sense of kind of individual panic that at any moment Russia might invade, um, communism might take over, there might be another massive attack from the, the atomic bomb, God only knows what's going to happen at any minute. And so part of the rise of suburbia was also um, the rise of sort of bunker culture, uh, people building bomb shelters in their own back garden and filling them with stuff that would keep them going, um, which I think those of us who have just come through a pandemic, which would be all of us, um, maybe kind of feel a little bit. I, I wonder if this is part of why Shirley Jackson is having a moment uh, at the moment, that some of the things that she writes about feel quite close to home, I think, in lots of ways. Um, so yeah, there was a sense not just that you bought your single family dwelling and that you set up your own little world in that single family dwelling, but that you also sort of prepared for a potentially nearer future where you'd have to go into even smaller spaces and be even more sort of self-reliant, which was obviously um, a sort of weir, weir word in American culture. They love the idea of being self-reliant. And so the idea of the backyard bunker was kind of, it tapped into all of those things. Uh, so yes, like I say, this was almost like a, a kind of little intensified sort of boiled down version of suburbia that, you know, the, the backyard bunker sort of metonymized a lot of the things that were going on in the, the sort of physical built environment anyway. And you got a lot of what they called prairie houses um, that were almost themselves a little bit bunker-like. They were low and they were flat. Um, most of the windows happened at the back rather than at the front. So you got these houses that kind of presented a, a very 
very kind of like, oh God, don't look at me, um, front to, to the street. And then all of the life happened out the back. So it was, you know, this wasn't kind of a suburbia where everyone was jolly and happy and talking to one another. It was a suburbia where everyone was literally trying to hide from one another and their houses were part of that. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright actually designed a lot of houses that were, you know, beautiful and expensive things. Um, and his plans then got turned into like really cheap versions of suburban houses that did the same thing with the low flash, windowless kind of frontage. Um, and yeah, on top of everything, um, as I've been suggesting, all of this comes with a whole pile of discourse suggesting that this was the best way to live. And again, Amy Bride does a really good job of talking about kind of spending and um, credit and, and the whole kind of delicate web of nothingness um, that all of this was built on because people were borrowing money to borrow money and it, it was all built on nothing. Um, but for a little while, it made a certain amount of sense for some people. So I um, came across this really great book during the week by Deborah Nelson um, called Pursuing Privacy in Cold War America. And it just explained an awful lot of stuff to me that I hadn't really been getting beforehand. So Nelson says that because of all the things that I've been talking about, this sense of kind of being squished up with other people in suburbia, but also sort of divided from them at the same time, the sense of kind of the fear of a looming Cold War, the fear of, um, sorry, a looming nuclear war. Um, the, and as a result, you got a lot of surveillance in American culture. You got a lot of wiretapping, you got a lot of um, people being accused of being secretly communist. Um, Jackson and her husband were actually investigated because they had quite an exciting and rebellious time when they were in college and they wrote a whole pile of communist uh, sort of newspapers and manifestos for their university publications. Um, and as a result, about 15 years later, they did get investigated by the House on America Committee. Just a little bit, they, they got away with it because they had enough money, they were fine. But it was a little wobbly for a bit. So as all of this kind of exemplifies, as Deborah Nelson says, there was a sense, um, and she's not really saying that privacy was actually dying. It was more that everyone was going, privacy is dying. What are we gonna do? This is terrible. Um, because it was seen as being vulnerable to penetration from within and exposure from without. So people, she says, seem to have got much more kind of confessional, not just in poetry and in writing, but also just in the way that they talk to one another. A lot of this um, can be kind of traced back to the things that Betty Friedan says about um, how kind of Freudian psychoanalysis, which I'll talk about in a minute, was really kind of popularized in America. At the time, everyone got very kind of gushy about their feelings and stuff, um, while also everyone was being surveilled from without. So she's so yeah, vulnerable to penetration from within and exposure from without. Surveillance, she says, though justified on the grounds of global political survival, was exercised in the ordinary realms of daily life as well. Um, and so because there was kind of a sense that the enemy, enemy could be anyone, it could be anyone hiding amongst us, anyone could be a, secretly a communist, it served both to multiply the sites of invasion, dispersing them across US social and political life, as well as to intensify them extending surveillance deeper into regions that did not then appear to be political, such as gender, sexuality, mental health, and personality. Um, so she says, God, I really didn't think out my slides at all. I should push everything up a little bit. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to read out this quotation because I can't actually see it because my screen sharing thing covers it. Um, but essentially she says that all of this means that the family um, and also the body and the self and the house, all of these things are seen on the one hand as being kind of this bastion of privacy that America somehow must get back for itself, but also as being themselves internal realms of surveillance that, you know, if you're in a world where everyone is like looking at everyone else going, eh, mommy issues, um, then suddenly the private realm is no longer private because the things that are part of, of all of that, things to do with sex, things to do with orientation, things to do with your gender roles are suddenly, you know, everyone is looking at them all the time. Um, I often think that the 1950s and people have acknowledged this are not unlike Puritan times in the United States where again, everyone was looking at one another. You ended up 
with the Salem witch trials. And obviously that's a connection that has been made several times um, by people like Miller in the Crucible. But yeah, it is, it's a, it's a very anxious time when everyone is looking at one another. Okay, I will push on. Um, so one of the things, um, coming back to what I was saying about Betty Friedman and the rise of psychoanalysis, one of the ways in which psychoanalysis was popularized, um, actually both on both sides of the Atlantic in sort of the early decades of the 20th century was through architecture. And there was a real push um, kind of following both of the world wars towards uh, sort of both a, a desire to make architecture sort of plain and rational to move away from twiddly, fancy ornateness that suddenly seemed sort of a bit, Bit irresponsible, a bit tacky in the wake of all the terrible things that had happened, but also a sense of wanting to make architecture clean and flowing and open so that there would be no dark nooks and crannies where various kinds of neuroses and psychoses could hide, that you literally had to kind of take the house and make it easily analyzable because it was clean and open and pure and free. So Le Corbusier says, for example, um, if we eliminate from our hearts and minds all dead concepts in regard to the house, we shall arrive at what he calls the house machine, the mass production house, healthy and morally so too, and beautiful in the ways that the working tools and instruments that accompany our existence are beautiful. So yeah, nothing extraneous, nothing fiddly, no dark, thick velvet curtains that germs and other things can lurk behind um, and secrets. So um, Anthony Wiedler, um, whose very useful book, The Architectural Uncanny, talks about these things. He says that as a result, you got a kind of house that had effectively its roof removed, replaced by a garden, its cellars filled in and its first floor open to the park, its horizontal windows and terraces encouraging the ceaseless flow of light and air. As a result, he says, modernism proposed to consign the cluttered interiors and insalubrious living, I hope that's conditions, um, of centuries to oblivion. So yeah, clean everything out. It was a grand housekeeping on sort of a vast architectural scale that was taking place um, in kind of the early decades of the 20th century. Now, as I was saying about suburbia, that's fine. You get these lovely clean white houses, stairs that have no handrails. Dear God, you should never have children in a house and that has stairs with no handrails. This is just a terrible idea. Um, it seemed great. The minute it rained, these houses looked really manky really quickly. They, they did not deal with like weather or pollution or anything. Things, things did not stay, stay as clean as, and open as they should be. Um, and one of the things as well that people say about um, Frank Lloyd Wright, who I mentioned earlier, who was kind of along these lines, though he did also like a bit of clutter himself. Um, but like apparently his houses were just really difficult to move into because everything was so carefully ordered that if you like put your sofa in the place where you wanted it to be, everything would just look a bit weird. So these were, they weren't practical houses, whatever the Corbusier might think. And one of the things that they do, um, this, you know, he talks about everything being kind of rational and like a tool and clean and perfectly ordered. You get apartment buildings um, are one of the things that happened as a result of this. And apartment buildings were really hailed as kind of the, the uber rational form of urban living in particular, like, you know, why should everyone be in like little separate houses along in a row? Wouldn't it make much more sense if we moved upward into the sky and Jackson doesn't have a lot of stories about apartments, but she has a couple. Um, and my favorite is Trial by Combat, where our protagonist um, moves into a new apartment building. She likes it a lot. She's a young, hip, urban, white professional. Everything is cool. Um, and then her neighbor um, starts to kind of poke around a little bit. Um, I think we're definitely getting kind of shades of Rosemary's Baby here um, or vice versa. And she eventually discovers that her neighbor, Mrs. Allen, has an apartment that looks exactly like hers. And then she quickly ends up in what looks like it's going to be a sort of single white female situation where Mrs. Allen starts stealing her stuff and like putting them in her own apartment so that Mrs. Allen's apartment starts to really look like the protagonist's apartment. But then you get this kind of flip where 
one day the protagonist just kind of wanders into Mrs. Allen's flat and starts going, oh, what if I lived here? What if this was my place rather than her place? And she starts by trying to take her own stuff back, but then she ends up kind of taking some of Mrs. Allen's stuff. And it's very Jackson. It doesn't really go anywhere. We're kind of left there. But we get this moment where she's standing in her neighbor's identical apartment to her own, thinking, I just want to pretend it's my own room. Um, so that if anyone comes in, I can say I was mistaken about the floor. Um, and for a minute, we're told, it seemed as if she were in her own room. The bed was neatly made, the shade drawn down over the window. Um, and when she looks around, she had a sudden sense of unbearable intimacy with Mrs. Allen. She thought, this is the way she must feel in my room. Now, on the one hand, I think stories like this are part of that kind of discourse that say you don't want to live in cities, you know, um, suburbia is much better, it's much more individualistic, you're not kind of cheek by jowl with your neighbour. On the other hand, Jackson also has a couple of stories, um, The Beautiful Stranger, if you haven't re read The Beautiful Stranger, it's, um, oh, it's just devastating, but it's exactly the same situation as this, but it's in suburbia, where a woman suddenly realises that she can't tell her own house apart from all of the other houses around her. She's not even really sure if her husband is her husband anymore, has he just been replaced by someone who looks a bit like her? So you get this real sense with kind of mass-produced architecture around this time that even though this is meant to be a hyper-individualist way of living, it's actually kind of also potentially the opposite, that you can have your own sense of an individual erased by all of this clean, rational, tidy, let's just make everything look like everything else kind of way of doing architecture. Um, so yes, I would highly recommend Trial by Combat. <laughs> so that's one issue. The other issue um, is that these very organized, very open, very clean looking rooms weren't great for the suburban housewife who was put into the situation where she had to occupy a highly feminized role. Um, and Betty Frieden again uh, talks very eloquently, I think, um, about the way that in particular, the open plan house uh, that again comes out of um, Frank Lloyd Wright is, is often blamed for the, the kind of rise of open plan suburban houses because he made these glorious, enormous places where, you know, everything kind of flowed into one room or another and there was no sense of division between them. When you scale that down into a cheap single family dwelling that you can literally buy as a flat pack, things are maybe not quite as wonderful and utopian and sort of free flowing as Frank Lloyd Wright might have wanted things to be. And as Frieden says, the result is that you end up with no true walls or doors, and basically you end up with one free flowing room instead of many rooms separated by walls and stairs, resulting in continual messes that continually needed picking up, and also a massive lack of privacy. This is the exact opposite of Virginia Woolf's idea of a room of one's own. You can never be alone in a place like this. Um, and all of this also kind of comes along at the same time that obviously it was really great that we had developments in sort of hygiene and, and the science of dirt and, and of how sort of germs and bacteria moved around the house. This was obviously a very good thing. Fewer people dying from unpleasant diseases that were easily fixed. But all of the weight again comes down on the housewife in this space where it's very difficult for her to keep clean advertisements, magazines, self-help books, all the rest of them put an awful lot of pressure on her to ensure that everything is as sort of germ-free and clean and open and welcoming as possible. Now, a lot of this, much like a 19th century, was kind of part of the idea was you want to make the place nice for your husband to come home to because otherwise he's going to go to the pub or he's going to go gambling or he might do even worse things and then the whole capitalist system falls apart and goes to work everything's terrible and um, so you know again all of this comes down on the wife it's an awful lot of pressure and it's pressure in a house that is not helping her at all so where all of this leads us is towards an understanding of the idea that physical spaces have agency. 
They are not, as haunted house novels continually tell us, they are not merely bricks and mortar. They are something more. And for me, I think when we come back to that kind of that vacillation between in the bird's nest, is Elizabeth's office actually falling apart or is it just, just that she's falling apart? I think that if we kind of see a sort of middle ground that the two things are falling apart and that the idea of sort of a haunted house is a way of making the, the sort of slightly vague abstractness of feeling like your house is telling you what to do, making it kind of personified, writing it large, making it something kind of clearer that you can see. Oh, if we can point to a ghost, then that's a bit more straightforward than just going, oh, you know, my house, it's just the way that it's set up. It's not really working for me. People don't really listen to you when you say that. People say, cop on, clean it a little bit more. Whereas when you say, no, no, my house is actually trying to kill me. Maybe that helps a little bit more. You know, maybe someone will go, yeah, okay. Maybe we need to fix that. So, um, one way of thinking about this is actually thinking about the things that houses do to us. They, on the one hand, physically tell us what to do. You know, I mean, at the moment, I am living in a small flat, which I like a lot. But what it doesn't have is a lot of wall space where I can put bookshelves. There are places where there are heaters. There are places where there are loads of plugs. There are weird little corners here and there. And... I got my landlord in and I got him to look around and he was like, yeah, you're right. There's nowhere else for a bookshelf here. This is not something that I can just fix with copping on a little bit more. This is the physical space of my house telling me what to do. In addition to that, you also get, as I've been saying, the fact that particular ways of living, whether that's an apartment or in a suburban house or, or in a massive mansion in the country, sort of dictate particular kinds of behavior within that house, whether that's gendered behavior or the way that you clean it or the way that you work or, you know, suddenly you have this three bed house, dear God, we should probably have some children to fill it. All of these things tell us what to do. We are not always in control. Daniel Miller, um, who is a sociologist, is very useful on this um, and in his book, Home Possessions, he says um, in particular, the home carries the burden of the discrepancies between its actual state and a wide range of aspirational ideal homes that are generated out of much wider ideals that a household might have for itself. Um, and so he says, when so all of those things that I was talking about, um, single women, having children, assimilation, all the rest of it, he says, as such, the home becomes not an expression of other people's gaze, but rather an interiorized and more controlled replacement of those absent others. So in other words, it's not so much that other people determine what we do, but the house itself actually sort of takes on social expectations. And some of that is inside us, some of that is in other people, some of that is in the house itself. And it's a big system where everyone is telling everyone else what to do, basically. Um, and we also get Philip Tristan saying the same thing, uh, that houses commit us to ideas we may not want to entertain and refuse to accommodate those we might prefer. Uh, and she's basically saying exactly the same thing. And I think that we get a little bit of this in Jackson's Hill House, um, where she, again, Amy Bright has quoted this passage. Um, we get kind of, when we're introduced to Hill House, first of all, we're more or less told this is a house that doesn't give two hoots about who lives in it and has its own ideas about what it wants to be. We are told the Hill House seems somehow to have formed itself, flying together into its own powerful pattern under the hands of its builders, fitting itself into its own construction of lines and angles. And we're told that it reared its great head back against the sky without concession to humanity. And I think that this is a really important line because it's very easy, and a lot of critics have done this in relation to Jackson, to see houses as almost like a, a kind of an outer shell for the individual as an expression of the individual's feelings, you know, kind of uncertainties, griefs, and all the rest of it. But actually, another way of looking at houses is that there is a mismatch, that there is a, a lack of concession to humanity when you live in them, because the houses just have their own ideas about how things are going to go. And Jackson's work really kind of externalizes that really neatly. So I'm going to push on because I'm going slightly over time. So um, I think 
one of my favorite stories by Shirley Jackson is called The Little House. Um, and yes, it is called The Little House. Sometimes I'm like, is it actually called The Lovely House? That's something else. Um, and it's just, it's a really short, really, really short, um, but it's kind of devastating. So we have our protagonist and she inherits a little house. Um, we're not really told if it's far away from where she lives. It is somewhere that she's been before, but it's nice. She inherits it from her aunt. And as the story opens, she walks in, she's all by herself and she's looking around and she thinks it belongs to me. I can do anything I want here and no one can ever make me leave because it's mine. She felt a sudden joy at the tangible reality of the little house. Um, it's really something to own, she thought. And she smiled at herself at the prospect of the very pleasant work she would do tomorrow and the day after, or all the days after that, living in her house and keeping it clean and fresh. So this is our protagonist. She has, you know, at this point, early point, she has this very utopian vision of what it's like to be in a single family dwelling but without all of the other stuff that comes with that. Being able to order it for herself, do things the way that she wants. And as she says, no one can ever make me leave because she physically owns it now. Now this is a Shirley Jackson story, so things don't go that well. Um, she is visited by two busybody elderly neighbors um, who start talking about how her aunt died and start freaking her out and making her think about intruders coming in in the middle of the night. And sure, yeah, the, the, the kind of the specter of the intruder here is, impo is important, but what's almost more important from my point of view is that when the two busy body, body neighbors eventually leave, but they're like, we'll be watching you. We know what you're doing. You're probably gonna throw out all your aunt's nice stuff. You terrible, terrible young woman. How dare you move in here to like her lovely place. The house turns against her. Literally, it ceases to be somewhere that you that she can imagine, you know, having control over, being able to clean for herself, being sort of, you know, seeing it as this like nice neat shell for herself. Suddenly the house becomes actively hostile. She tries to go upstairs to bed. Um, and she's like, okay, it's fine, it's fine. Leave the kitchen light on all night, Grant, don't worry about that. Um, but then she's like, okay, they'll see it from their windows. Hmm. And then did the intruder wait for her aunt on the stairs? So one, she's got the sense of surveillance, and then two, she's got the sense of the intruder. Those two things go hand in hand in this story. Um, so then she tries to go up the stairs, staring into the darkness, feeling her way with her feet. At the top was only darkness. She put out her hands blindly. There was a wall and then a door, and she ran her hands down the side of the door until she had a doorknob in her fingers. What's waiting behind the door? She flees wildly down the stairs, and ends up shouting, don't leave me here, don't leave me here alone. So it is literally a complete reversal. And this is, again, it's a very Jackson thing. Jackson has great control over the language that she uses. It's often quite simple language, but when she repeats something, you pay attention. So yeah, our poor protagonist here has gone from feeling like she has control over her house to realizing that actually her house has control over her. And we get this kind of almost ritualistic sort of evocation of doorknobs and stairs and darkness and the floor and the wall and all the rest of it to the point where like the house itself is it's a real looming presence in this story and suddenly she doesn't want to be alone but on the at the same time she doesn't want to be surveyed she doesn't want to be invaded but she also doesn't want to be alone and this is an impossible situation that we get in a house like this so okay so one of the ways that we can think about the, the kind of process of suburban living like this is the idea of the doll's house. And this is something that shows up an awful lot in a lot of these kind of texts. Um, and in particular, where I kind of started noticing this was in Richard Matheson's The Shrinking Man, which is from 1956. So he was a contemporary of Shirley Jackson, probably writing a little bit earlier than her um, most of the time, but then he and I kept going afterwards. And if you don't know The Shrinking Man, the premise is that the main character gets sprayed by chemicals on two different occasions and he ends up shrinking by a seventh of an inch every day, perfectly in proportion. Um, and eventually, as you can see in the black and white picture here, hopefully, um, he becomes so small that 
his wife buys him a doll's house to live in. Which seems like a great idea. It just seems perfect, right? But as we get in this passage, he says, everything is fake. Right. Nothing, nothing works. Life in the dollhouse was not truly life. Um, you know, he could try and play the piano, but the keys were painted on. He might wander into the kitchen, yank at the refrigerator, but it was all in one piece. You couldn't open the door. Um, the knobs on the stove moved, but didn't do anything. He couldn't boil the water on it. On and on and on and on. So now in some ways, and I, again, I think this is kind of another issue, but I often think of this passage as being like, sort of a depiction of the, the sort of perceived uselessness of male presenting people in domestic situations at the time. The house was not a place for men. They were meant to be out at work the whole time and he'd be there, you know, fiddling with the stove, trying to make himself a cup of tea um, and that probably wouldn't go very well because you didn't really know what he was at. But um, there's also kind of a real sense that this is meant to be a private space. It's meant to be somewhere that he can live but as you can hopefully see in this picture, it actually makes him even more surveyed. The very fact of having his own little house that seems to be perfectly made for him means that his wife is constantly looming over him as this like big looming presence. You know, his daughter can come in and pick him up at any time because the whole back of the house opens. His privacy has given him no privacy. And once you start noticing it, you start realizing that there are dolls' houses all over Gothic and Horror. Um, even just the sort of little model of the maze that we get in The Shining. Here you can see Jack Torrance again looming over it, just like people tend to loom over dolls' houses in these things. Um, if you haven't seen Stephen King's miniseries Rose Red, it is a bit silly. It hasn't dated very well um, at all, but there's a really interesting dolls' house in it. Um, now he's a big Shirley Jackson fan, so I think that there's probably a fair bit of this going on. Um, but, but, so in Shirley Jackson's The Sundial, and I am coming to a conclusion, I promise, um, there is also a doll's house, a doll's house that is uh, a perfect replica of the larger house that everyone is living in, in The Sundial. Um, and the slightly chilling little girl, who is the youngest character, um, whose name is Fancy, she really likes her doll's house. Um, and what she really likes about it is the fact that the dolls, as we're told in this quotation, fit exactly into the chairs and the beds. If little dishes, when I put them to bed, they have to go to bed. And then she says, when my grandmother dies, all this is going to belong to me. And one of their hangers on says, and where would we be then, Fancy? She says, when my grandmother dies, I'm going to smash my doll's house because I won't need it anymore. So I think what we really get in this and in The Shrinking Man and in these other images that I've put up here is the sense of the single family dwelling as being open to power. The, essentially, it's a way of like telling people what to do. You know, what we get Fancy saying here is that she's like, my dolls have to do what I tell them to do. They fit into the beds. This is where they belong. Therefore, this is where they're going to stay. And the very fact that she's saying that she's going to smash it when her grandmother dies, when she inherits the house, means that she's like, you lot, you're all dolls in my doll's house, and I can then fit you into the beds and make you do things at particular times of day. So, yeah, essentially, houses are expressions of power. And the idea of the doll's house, again, is a really useful way of kind of externalizing that or, or making it kind of clear. So, um, come on. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because I have talked too much, um, but if you're interested, um, Shirley Jackson's short story, A Visit, um, is, I think, sort of a version of this in lots of ways. Um, again, you get kind of, just like I was saying in Rose Red and in The Sundial, you get kind of pictures and models and tapestries and all the rest of it that are exact replicas of the house that they're all in. So we get our, our main character goes to stay with her friend um, in this kind of amazing house where everyone is a little bit odd and the house is just full of miniature replicas of itself over and over and over and over again and the ultimate suggestion is that not unlike the protagonist in the little house that she is now at the mercy of this house that keeps representing itself over and over again that she's been kind of 
brought in almost as a kind of sacrifice that this is this is essentially what wives are. If a house is passed down through the, the kind of patrilineal line, then wives are sort of external people who get brought in to keep the place, to maintain it, to, like I say, to, to keep it clean, to sort of exercise it of all negative connotations. And spoiler, um, the story does seem to kind of suggest that this is what has happened, that over the years, the house starts to kind of decay and things start to chip and fall off. And they bring in a new woman who's then kind of like incarcerated in the house. And by being there, she sort of renews everything in a strange sort of supernatural way. And if you're interested, Robert Marasco's book, Burnt Offerings, kind of extends this idea into a, a full novel. It's, it's very 70s, but yeah, it's interesting. The film version is terrible, don't even bother. Um, and Jackson also has uh, something similar in a very short story called The Story We Used to Tell, which was unpublished during her lifetime. Um, and again, we get a room in a big house that has a picture of the same big house. And again, female characters end up getting trapped there. Anyone who tries to rescue them also gets trapped. It's maybe a kind of slightly less fully worked through version than, than a visit, but it's exactly the same idea. Um, and yeah, it's, these are beautiful houses. They are houses that it's nice to live in, that, you know, they're elegant and organized, but the more elegant and organized they are, the more they are dependent on literally kind of trapping a woman within them. And again, if you're interested, Doris Carol Oates has a short story called Doll that I think is very much kind of harking back to a lot of what Jackson says. So um, finally, and this is my last slide, and then I will stop. Again, slight spoiler. I think that all of this is a useful way to read, not quite the ending, but the near ending of Jackson's last completed novel, which is We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Um, so I won't tell you everything that happens, but essentially you get two sisters, um, Constance and Mary Kat Blackwood, who are living in, again, a beautiful, gracious house that they like cleaning. They're kind of slightly stuck cleaning it. They, they have very kind of rigid routines where they do the same thing on the same day every week, clean the same things in exactly the same way. But, you know, it's this is less of the, the kind of scary, compulsive sort of housework and more of the like, this is our place, we're going to make it just like the protagonist at the start of The Little House thinks she's going to do. This is like, yeah, that nice kind of creative version of housework. The townspeople don't like them. Things come to a head. There is a fire. There was some trampling. And near the end of the novel, the two sisters find themselves in their house, which has now been kind of partially burnt and ruined. And a lot of their beautiful things have been trampled. And we get this passage and I will read it and talk about it briefly and then I'll finish. So this is this is all from the point of view of Mary, Ka Mary Catherine. Um, and she's kind of standing there going, okay, what are we gonna do? How are we going to live in this house that is partially burnt? She says the hall was dark with two narrow lines of sunlight coming through the two narrow glass panels sat on either side of the door. We could look outside through the glass, but no one could see in, which is important to you, even by putting their eyes up close because the hall was dark. Above us, the stairs were black and led into blackness or burnt rooms with incredibly tiny spots of sky showing through. Until now, the roof had always hidden us from the sky, but I did not think that there was any way we could be vulnerable from above. I like that too. Stood at the foot of the stairs looking up, wondering where our house had gone. The walls and the floors and the beds and the boxes of things in the attic. I could feel a breath of air on my cheek. It came from the sky I could see, but it smelled of smoke and ruin. Our house was a castle turreted and open to the sky. All right, always gets me for some reason. Um, so there's a couple of things going on here, right? First of all, really importantly, when she says we could look outside through the glass, but no one could see in. This is like, okay, things are dreadful for the two sisters. Their house has been burnt. All their beautiful things are gone. It's quite clear that the, you know, the villagers really, really did hate them um, and harbored some violence towards them. But now all of that sense of surveillance and external power, it has literally been burnt away. It's just, it's gone, right? And if we come back to that scene in the little house where the protagonist tries to go upstairs into the darkness, 
yes, we have stairs leading up into darkness here, but actually it's just like that bit of the house is gone. We don't have to deal with that anymore. If you wanted to kind of really go far with this, you could be like, well, the bedrooms upstairs are the place where procreation happens. Maybe that's one of the other things that the sisters don't have to worry about anymore. They are most likely the last of their family line or, or close to it, depending on what happens with their odious cousin. Um, but, you know, they no longer have to worry about all of those kinds of gendered and sexualized behaviors that houses supposedly insert you into. There's also that little bit where she says that there is no way that we could be vulnerable from above and that I'm like, oh, is there kind of something here about bombing potentially happening in the background? Sorry that um, I should maybe have warned about that before I said it. Um, but in the context of the 1950s and the Cold War and the, the fear of nuclear attack, I think there's a certain amount of that going on here. Um, and then we get, like I was saying earlier, we get this kind of like ritualistic evocation of the physical parts of the house, the things that had gone, the walls and the floors and the beds and the boxes. She doesn't mention doors or doorknobs, but they're more or less there. These things are gone. So the kind of things that were oppressing the protagonist in the little house, they're all gone. And I think this is something I won't go into because I will stop here. Um, but essentially this idea that their house was a castle turreted and open to the sky. This is actually quite a complex image because on the one hand, a castle, we tend to see that as a fortress. It's somewhere that is safe, that you hide within it, that you know you keep your enemies out, but it's also open. So there's kind of a suggestion here, I think, that because this house no longer has the roof that should be in sort of ensuring privacy, it is actually somehow more private. Okay, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing. <laughs>